Woman, behold your son. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I already missed Father Tom. <laughs> really, I miss him. Uh, yesterday, he made me into a cross for all of you. <laughs> you have to carry, carry me as a cross, and he put a lot of cross on me, but I already miss him. And uh, in the future, all of us will miss him. Miss him a lot. So, now, Woman, behold your son. St. Bernard Level, who was a soldier, in fact, he was uh, like a general. In his youth, he brought the whole troop. His brothers went to the Holy Land, entered the crusade, Holy Crusade, and get back, you know, <coughs> the for the Lord, for the Holy Roman <coughs> Empire, the Holy Catholic Church. Triumphant, came back to Rome and saw those religious <coughs> monks living so rich, so wealthy, so opulent, and there were so many corruptions, you know, so a lot of corruptions in uh, this religious life. And at that time, instead of doing something like Martin Luther did, um, Reformation, he did something else. He reformed himself. He and his brother, band of brothers, decided uh, he took the law of Saint Benedict. Instead of changing other others and condemning them, he changed himself. He applied the, the rule of Saint Benedict in a personal way, the strictest way, and he founded the Cistercian. They have the same Benedictine spirituality. And as, it's not as a challenge, but it is a challenge to self. And get rid of that enemy of God, the ego. He did that with Mary, and uh, he is uh, one of the most uh, famous advocate for Mary. He wrote a lot on Mary. And uh, we know the memoria, the prayer, comes from St. Bernard level. So he says something about this gospel today. Woman, behold your son. Jesus on the cross was about to die. And he gave everything. And then he looked at his mother. He did not call her Mary, mother. He called woman, behold your son. And St. Bernard said, this is not a good exchange at all. Jesus for John, son of God for son of Zebedee, disciple for the Lord, servant for the Master, is unfair. And afterward, after Jesus died, what happened was, of course, we know Jesus died, and then there was that uh, centurion, Roman centurion, he took a spear and then pierced his heart. Jesus was dead already. And pierced the heart of Jesus, he did not feel the pain at all. Who felt the pain? No, he couldn't feel anything. But Mary was the one. And I said this before, she would rather die for her son than allowing uh, her son to be killed, but she could not. It is the will of God that her son has to die, and he died. Witnessing, you know, not just the death of your son because uh, your son contracts some kind of uh, terminal disease that's different, but here, condemned as a criminal and punished, okay, have this crucifixion as the most, like the, the, the severest of all punishment, banished. From, from the whole world, we tried and she was there, looking at him and observing and seeing what happened to her son. That is, is breaking, really piercing the heart of Mary, and that is really heartbreaking, and that is where we, we celebrate the sorrow of Mary today. Now, when we take a look at that, and we observe what Mary did, the question is this, did Mary say anything at the foot of the cross? 
nothing. Nothing. When we hear the word of Saint Bernard that Jesus gave John to Mary, woman, behold your son. And we think that is an, an unfair exchange. But if you look with Mary from her heart and from her eyes, you see something else. Because according to the tradition, if you go to the Holy Land, it is impossible for Mary not to be at the Last Supper. Who prepared that place, you know, the cynical, for the Last Supper? And Jesus said, okay, he told two disciples, right? Go there and you see the man with the, you know, the water on his head and came the and okay, and tell the Lord needs the room, right? Who prepared it? Well, the implication, you know, from the, the tradition, not from the gospel, not from the writings, of course, Mary prepared it. She had to be there. And what happened? What happened in at the Last Supper? Jesus instituted the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of Holy Order. Now, as I, in my uh, young priestly life, uh, 18 years, and every time I celebrate the Mass, every time the Lord teaches me something new, every day, the one thing I know, this, this, is, this is beyond human comprehension and imagination. A mere man, a sinful person, a sinner, more sinful than anyone else. I deserve hell many times, thousand times. This mere man, filthy, dirty, the Lord God gives this authority and power to bring him down on earth, anytime, anywhere. What is going on here? What is the Lord giving John, the other apostle, the other eleven apostles, and all the other apostles, and priests and, and bishops, giving these mere men, human beings, the power and authority to bring God to earth? I don't know if you, know, if you compare to being a king or queen or a president. Who has that kind of power? <coughs> God did that. Jesus did that. He prepared it for his mother. And when he said, Woman, this is your son, John. Now behold your son, John. Okay? John was ordained to the priesthood authority. Do this in memory of me. That is the holy order. This is my body. That is the Holy Eucharist. And John has the authority and the power to bring Jesus into his heart, his soul, his life, his body, his mind. And Jesus lives in him. And he can share Jesus in a real way for everybody to share in that body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so, behold your son, me, in there. Because the night before, John received the Holy Eucharist, isn't it? The precious blood and the body of Jesus Christ, the blessed sacrament. And he was there. At the Garden of Gethsemane with him. And he, he was there at the foot of the cross. He had the Holy Eucharist in him. I am there. This is truly your son. And if you look at it from the human point of view, oh, it's, it's very un, uh, an unfair exchange. But Jesus was deeper than that, and Mary saw it. Truly, John is my son because he has your blood, he has your body, Jesus. And he has my blood and my body as well. And so all those who receive the precious blood and the body of Jesus Christ, we are called children of Mary at the same time. It's different than just physical, carnal, sensual way of thinking, <coughs> spiritual way of thinking, or seeing things. Now, what is this suffering? What is this sorrow? And how could Mary conquer it? Simply, uh, it is a shame, a humiliation, since to be related or associated with a criminal. And this criminal is crucified on the cross, okay? And it's very dangerous for these people. I suppose you know, you know, Ted Bundy, right? Ted Bundy. How many people he killed? Like 27? And the last one he killed, uh, 13 years old. 
he chopped off the body of these you know, women and he put in a freezer, he ate them. Ted Bundy and he was executed here in Texas. Now, imagine you're the family member, right? And you're associated and when they executed him and you're there, mother, friend. Oh, you're the mother of that criminal. Right? People want to kill you. They hate Ted Bundy and they hate you. Mary was there. Associate by association, and Mary brought along with her this little kid, a teenager. Maybe he was in, you know, his eighteen or nineteen years old, John. Well, and then this, and there's another woman. Everybody knew this woman. All the Roman soldiers and the even the scribes and Pharisees and the priests. Maybe they know this woman. He, she was famous and infamous because they used her. They paid her. This prostitute. Mary associated himself with his son as a, a criminal and then this prostitute. Terrible shame. But she was there. And she was not ashamed of being the mother. Nobody consoled Jesus, but she was there in silence. And suffer. But she knew she had that faith. She had that before because let it be done to me according to thy word. And God came and she knew. Let it be done according to thy word. That, that fiat has more value and meaning at the foot of the cross. More than just the incarnation, the fiat of the annunciation, isn't it? That time at the foot of the cross, she really obeyed, submitted to herself. A lot of, and there was a story of this, uh, this uh, elderly priest in our religious uh, order. And she said, this woman came to him and, and saying, Father, uh, I, why, why, why my children and my, my husband never listen to me? You know, I go to this you know, group and praising and, and singing and dancing and praise the Lord. And one day, you know, Mary appeared to me and spoke to me, had that uh, allocution. And I hear the voice of God and I come home and tell my husband, children, they don't listen to me. And then the next week, well, well, St. Paul came to me and gave me this power, the speaking in tongue, and that fire to preach the good news. And I went home, I preached to my husband, my children, they don't listen to me. What's going on? I have all these gifts. And this elderly priest said, well, perhaps instead of uh, imitating all those things, you should go home and maybe imitate Mary. Try to be silent. Hmm. And then your husband, your children will listen to you. Silent suffering with joy, not the joy of the world, but the joy that is beyond comprehension. The joy of Mary. She saw Jesus. She saw. And she knew he conquered death. Suppose we have time go to the Holy Land, uh, go there, and feel what Mary felt. Feel it. Uh, it is not just, is not just uh, talking about it. I encourage all of us to enter into that mystery of the sorrow of Mary, the sorrow because she loved. And let us pray with Mary, with uh, one Hail Mary, and pray for our children who we confirm this evening. Full of grace and glory to thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death.